philosophy has a bad name, and I'm not sure about this group, but you know, in general, if you walk around and you say you are a philosopher, they look at you suspiciously. So, so, uh, because uh, now, what do you really do? Exactly. Uh, uh, and normally the answer is that you teach philosophy. So okay, that's fine, as if. Like. But if you do philosophy as in doing philosophy, instead of teaching it, you're really suspicious. Um, the reason being that, unfortunately, philosophy goes ups and downs. I mean, the history of philosophy, if any of you has read anything about it or has been exposed, uh, and I might be actually talking to colleagues, I don't know, and I'd rather not know, uh, it goes into waves. Uh, it's not uh, a history that has a very nice straight line of developments and contributions, but it's more like um, uh, great ideas which then become uh, increasingly scholastic and self-serving, it becomes a discourse, I talk about your paper, you talk about my paper, and it's that little problem. We move from philosophical problems to philosopher's problems nobody cares about, and then society, history, some scientific revolution, a major transformation pushes people back again into the philosophical problems arena. And then you go up again, and then it's interesting and stuff. And then, you know, unfortunately, all that interest gets sort of diluted and becomes internal discourse, and then up again. So until recently, we were into a sort of scholastic ivory tower stage, where philosophers, uh, in, even these days, in fact, if you see what we, we publish in our specialized journals, uh, are utterly irrelevant. They we made ourselves irrelevant. Uh, we told the world that all philosophy had to do was to clean up the language and possibly show that some problems that everybody feels are important are in fact misconceptions. So solving problems by eliminating or dissolving problems, that was the agenda. Once you've done that, you clearly are redundant. Uh, you, if there were any coherence, we should be closing philosophy departments. Uh, fortunately, that was not the case, as in that was not the task of philosophy, uh, and therefore we're not closing philosophy departments either. Uh, so what I'm going to try to show you today is that there's plenty of philosophical work that needs to be done in uh, uh, our society, information society, uh, and uh, at this particular stage of development of human culture. Uh, any philosophical discourse that tries to uh, retrench behind some kind of ivory tower is not just pointless, which wouldn't be that much harmful. I mean, there's plenty of pointless research all over the place, but it will be irresponsible, and then the judgment is harsher. As in, philosophy will be living, and philosophy by mean uh, by philosophy I mean any anything, not necessarily done by philosophers professionally, but I mean any critical thinking about open problems, uh, will be leaving the ground empty to other people with. Uh, worst messages, fundamentalist, gurus of all kinds, and that's where philosophy has a responsibility not to uh, retrench behind the ivory tower. So, speaking of ivory tower, uh, there's plenty of you know, ivory sort of uh, tower in, back in the place uh, uh, at Oxford, uh, but the kind of work that we're trying to do at the Oxford Inter Institute is um, a little bit more engaged with the world and the information revolution. And that's what I want to talk about today with you. Um, the usual line is that you don't have to agree with me, but if we disagree, we better know about what we disagree. So disagreement is welcome, as long as it's not based on misunderstanding. So, in terms of avoiding misunderstanding, I'll uh, tell you very quickly, because I know you know, so no patronizing on my side, just to be on the same page, uh, a little bit about the information revolution, and then uh, two uh, items. One, uh, time has time has changed, as in not the physics time, but time as in understood uh, by us, our age. In space, in other words, our environment. Um, so our age and our environment, how they have changed, and then how that, you know, basically one, two, and three, have affected our self-perception, uh, how we understand human nature. With that uh, leading to, and that I hope it will be a matter of uh, Q&A and discussion, uh, some challenges that the information revolution, a reconceptualization of our environment and our, our age and our nature at this time and in this environment uh, have led to. Uh, going straight to something that you know, so I, just a reminder, uh, in case the coffee was not strong enough. This is iconic, is Wikipedia level, everybody knows. That's the processing power uh, and how it has developed, more slow, etc. We're not quite sure whether it will keep going this way, because physics has some limits, unfortunately. But to the best of our understanding, uh, this is going to go for an, another while. Um, what uh, is less visible is the other side of the coin, how little everything costs, uh, how much all their power has become so cheap. As cheap as this, and I make sure I don't fall all over the place, 
Suppose you have a, an archaeological piece of, archae of, of technology in your house, an iPad 2, uh, 2010, old stuff. That thing was able to process, and do we have something to point here? Yes, there's a pointer on the round button in the middle. Where's the in the middle. It's not very strong. There, no. So, finger will do. Um, <coughs> used, uh, an iPad 2 had as an average sort of power, in terms of processing power, 1,600 million of instructions per second, no, MIPS, which by the time you finish that sentence, it's a lot of processing power. <laughs> so every second that goes, it had 1,600 million of instructions already processed. Great. Make that equal to $100. That's, suppose that that's what it cost to, part, to buy this particular power in 2010. Well, this is down here, 2010, and that's the cost on iPad 2, processing power. This is the cost of that same power back in the years, 80s, 70s, 60s, all the way down to the 40s when we started all this wonderful revolution. The very top, sorry, the very top number here, that 100 with all those zeros, the joke is that only American generals can read those numbers. Uh, that's <laughs> dollars that you've never seen in your life. I mean, not, it's not HSBC kind of dollars. It's just beyond belief. That, in fact, is uh, higher than the equivalent in 2010 of the GDP of Kuwait. So you start getting a sense of what you had in your hands in 2010. We should have been way more respectful of that little gadget. Uh, where all that power went into generating trillions of billions of fantastic gazillions of data. And by, I mean data, I don't mean information, meaning that the conversation on Skype, those little cats on Facebook, that's all data, 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 stuff. Less. For those of you too far away down there, I apologize, but uh, we were all born outside this particular uh, circle. Uh, the internal circle is 2009. Uh, let's see, uh, over here, if you read, if you see the red dot, 2009, 0 0.8 uh, zettabyte of data. Since the day we started scratching cows on a cave, uh, that's from that time until 2008. 2008, 2020, 35. That, that's immense. That's 35 times more than we ever generated in the past. Now, suppose that that's wrong by a large margin, 50%. That's still staggering. That's still amazing. Suppose it's only, no, it's not 35,000, not 35 times. It's only double. Like, okay, that's amazing. I mean, we produce more data in the last decade than in the whole human history for millennia. Of course, we don't know how much of that is total rubbish. As they say in advertisement, uh, half the money spent is uh, badly spent, you just don't know which half. Uh, the other problem which we've not discussed today is that, and I haven't seen discussed uh, uh, widely, but we should, uh, is that all that grey half circle there is, comes with a sort of baby boom retirement sort of uh, label. We created all the data we have, basically, in a decade or two. That's all, all going to grow up together, get old together, and become unreadable together because of support, uh, failures, etc. That didn't happen to books, which you know, <laughs> thousands of years to accumulate in manuscripts. But all the data we have, the digital ones, they all have the same, more or less, timestamp. That is going to go in you no know, together. There is a whole army that is marching in line. It's going to cause some problems, uh, but we'll see this in the future. So there are no limits that we can think of in terms of how this stuff is going to grow, apart from thermodynamics. I said, oh, physics is getting uh, a saying about how much you can do with all this. Intelligence, ours, they're the only one available in the universe as far as I'm concerned. And memory, memory as in support. The stuff where you put the data is the data that don't float in the clouds, despite you know, the phrase. Of course, all this, and I'm just preparing the ground, so I know you know, so bear with me comes with lots of problems. Acquisition and storage, where you put the data. Usability, well, once, you're, once they're there, can I use them? <laughs> when, how, how quickly? Security and safety, are you sure that I am the only one who can actually use this data so well? So? Accessibility, as in, well, no, suppose that, no, they are there, but it's very hard to get them. Accessibility being also a huge right to be forgotten issue, um, as opposed to availability. Analytics. For those of you who actually uh, deal with this uh, black magic art, uh, all this constrained by law and ethics, and of course at the bottom of all this, the usual variable which affects everything in life, money. Because anything you do here will come with a price. 
a price in feasibility, a price in cost, a price in new machines, a price in hiring people, a price in not getting the right in, you know, opportunity cost, etc. So this is the picture, and just to, again, give you a sense of, we could go in many different directions, this is one we will not pursue. This is old data, very old, uh, it's, but it's the only data I could find about the difference between the data, forget about information, the economist being a little bit generous with the word, uh, the data we're generating, remember those 35 gazillions of things, and how much support we are producing in the world. That sense of my phone is full, I cannot put more pictures in it, so I better erase something if I want to take another picture, well, that's a planetary issue. Since 2007, we haven't produced enough support for the data we're generating, meaning there's not enough memory where to locate the data. With a simple result, trivially, that on a global scale, not you and me can afford more, no, I just buy another USB. No, on a global scale, either we do not register something because there's no space in the first, so in the first place, we don't produce it, it can't be put anywhere, or is first in, first out, those nice emails from two years ago, who needs them? Dale, boom, gone, never exists in the first place. Or there's a struggle about who gets what amount of memory. And if you are in any department where the ICT office says, well, 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 this project cannot go there because the hard disk is full. So, oh, but it's my hard disk. You know, how do, why don't we kick out that old project, which we don't need? So, so there's a struggle there that can be manipulated. So. But that was just as a way of introduction. That's, that's where we, we've been for the past few years. It has generated huge uh, changes, one in time and one in, in space, which I want to uh, sort of share with you. The one in time uh, is, um, again, you find all this in the book, so uh, it's a bit of a self advertise um, Here's a suggestion, uh, which I, I hope is sufficiently um, reasonable. So textbook material, not my own. Uh, if you disagree with me, you disagree with so the, the textbook, which is fine, but just in case. Prehistory is defined as any stage in human development when there is no way of recording the present for future consumption. There's only oral culture. <coughs> Grandma said so, and that's why I have the recipe. But if I forget, that's it. The recipe disappears. Nobody knows because there's no written, written recipe for that particular thing. So it's prehistory and history and hyperhistory, they work like adverbs. Is how you live not at time in sort of some magic uh, sort of uh, scale line. There are still some very few uh, people, probably in the Amazonian uh, environment, which you know, few uh, tribes that live in no, uh, sort of uh, prehistorically. They have no way of writing, uh, basically. 6,000 years ago, here and in China, we developed writing, and we moved from prehistory to history. Now, history is a stage where individual and social well-being no, you and your society, they start getting better also because there is some way of communicating, uh, a way of, no, that problem has been solved by grandpa and it's written here, so I can do it again. Or, no, those, no, they are no, chiseled somewhere in marble and then you get somewhere, etc. So individual and social well-being starts being related to ICT, but it's not yet dependent on ICT. Now, by dependent, I don't mean, oh, of course, we need food and shelter, and, and of course. But today, in a society like this one, uh, and some other Europeans ones, and some others in North America, and so on, the development, the, what makes it the added difference is exactly ICT. Now, if you think that that's too philosophical, uh, here's the counter sort of uh, balance to the speculation. Any country that can be subject to cyber war is a country that de depends hugely on is ICT infrastructure. If you can be harmed by a cyber attack, clearly you live in a hyper-historical society. A society which depends for its individual social well-being on things of uh, airspace uh, or hospitals, databases, and so on. So in a, a hyper-historical context, well, those who live by the digit, they die by the digit, just to not be uh, memorable phrase from another book. Um, you know that we're moving into a different stage because there are plenty of attempts, failed attempts, as far as I'm concerned, to make sense of our culture. You wouldn't have a cyber culture movement, a post-humanist movement, a singularity rubbish, if you 
didn't feel that, oh my goodness, something is really changing here, and how do we make sense of all this? I did say on record, singularity rubbish, just in case. <laughs> Um, as I will show you later, I mean, just not bad, bad mouthing people. It is rubbish in a sort of um, scientific sense. What we really need is, of course, these attempts are leading somewhere, but they are more like uh, false steps. It's like, oh, something is going on, something needs to be understood and rephrased. And, uh, but what we really are facing is a new philosophy of nature, where nature and technologies are becoming so intrinsically related that it's very hard to be so, a green person who thinks that the environment is only trees and valleys, a new philosophical anthropology, which I will discuss today, and basically a new political philosophy, which I discussed this morning with some colleagues at uh, UCD. But there's plenty of work here that needs to be done, because we are, as you were, stepping into a new uh, territory. Now, remember that philosophy never rewrites chapters, adds chapters to its book. So I'm not saying that what has been done so far has to be dismissed. I'm saying it's time to write a new chapter having read the previous ones, relying on the previous ones. That's a good story we have. But no, it's chapter 20, time to write chapter 21st century, because that chapter is still missing. Time and hype history, space. It's a beautiful uh, reference to Galileo, local hero for people from Italy. Um, two, at least two lessons to be learned uh, here. One. This is a very famous uh, quotation which describes the, the book of nature uh, in sort of uh, mathematical symbols and uh, no, science is reading these symbols. I said two, but actually three uh, are the points here. One, a lot of science used to be considered by Galileo, Newton, until recently as a description of the world, but there's plenty of science that makes the world, builds the world. You speak to any poietic, as in Greek, poiesis, construction science, as in engineering, computer science. And they don't simply describe the world, they're actually building it. So, oh, it's not science. Well, of course it is. You better, better you know, get a grip. But it's not a description of planets. It's a construction of, say, ICT uh, systems. So there's this divide already happening, which Galileo didn't have. Second lesson, uh, a bit of philosophy of mathematics, for those of you, maybe for the Q&A. Funny enough, I mean, Descartes and the algebraic revolution has already happened a long time ago. But Galileo still thinks that the books of mathematics is a geometrical book. And for anyone who lives in these centuries, like, it does, we don't think this way anymore. For us, if you ask anyone down the road and says, what's mathematics? Oh, two plus two. Oh, no, the, math, the, the numbers. They would not say geometry. But we were coming from about two millennia or so, or geometry being the queen of all mathematical sciences. The shift hasn't happened yet. So beautiful point. But above all, uh, what does it mean to read a book when you actually have a science, as I said a moment ago, that can actually write the book? Well, this is, this is interesting, because that science is no longer a matter of reading what nature has written there, or the book, but it's actually a way of adding to it. And this is what I'd like to discuss with you. Now, this uh, Herbert Simon, uh, a Nobel laureate in a variety of topics, <laughs> as well, great financier, but also great economist, and so on, the beautiful book, if you have a chance, uh, The uh, Science of the Artificial, he writes, AI is not a science of nature. Remember, the book of nature, a description, read the book. That's, uh, uh, say, uh, biology for you. Or a science of culture. It's not anthropology. Yeah. But it's a science of the artificial. And, uh, well, thank you, but so? <laughs> what is that? Well, this is my contribution to clarify the point. I'm not sure whether Simon would have uh, agreed. Uh, it works well in English, it doesn't work in other languages. AI does not describe the world as, say, um, uh, astronomy. It does not prescribe the world as, as say, uh, uh, law or other similar uh, uh, endeavors. But it actually inscribes the world with new artifacts. So what, when you have the book of nature written in mathematical symbols, what happens if you write a piece of code? Well, you just add it to the book of nature. Well, that's the way of looking at this. So it's not a matter of uh, no, building robots that can read the book of nature, because once you build a robot, you actually add it to the book of nature with a new artifact, which is a mathematical you know, artifact, etc. Well, if this works, then, uh, then there's a way of understanding uh, artifacts in a way that has been sort of uh, obscured by the debate for the past 50 years on AI. AI used to be a debate between two departments, uh, cognitive science and engineering science. Uh, AI departments from cognitive science, they tell you, we want to create 
non-biological intelligence. It doesn't matter how stupid, but it will be the real thing. Maybe the intelligence of a spider, but it will be intelligence. Non-biologically generated. The engineering says, I don't care about intelligence. All I care is that it does so and so, this and that, which if I were to do it, it would require my intelligence. But the thing there, there, it can be as stupid as a toaster, it doesn't matter as long as the problem is solved. Now in this you know, problem solving versus uh, cognition, etc., what we've been doing meanwhile, these two blocks, they were still thinking about uh, artificial intelligence as something that you would build and either being a problem solving or the real thing at some point, the real <coughs> intelligence. But meanwhile, what we did was to transform the environment to make sure that the environment would be stupidity friendly. It's our environment which has become AI compatible rather than vice versa. That's why you know, Google's car can work because there's plenty of data out there, sensors and databases and maps that can feed into it, not because there's a shred of any possible intelligence in it. So what I like to call the danification or envelope in the world, um, that's what has happened really. Now in robotics, an envelope, uh, borrowing this from robotics, um, is the 3D space where an arm is success successful, can operate. And think of it, what we do in an in industrial context is to build a whole environment around the stupid robots. You don't unleash robots in the, st in, in, in the street and say, build me a car. You build a so-called ontology, in other context, an environment around the simple or perhaps sophisticated but still stupid abilities of the machine there. So the picture that I'd like you to have in mind to simplify is the dishwasher. The dishwasher is the perfect realization of a robot. No, stupid mechanism inside, you build a whole environment around it to make sure that the stupid mechanism is successful, very successful. Nobody in his right mind would not wash dishes that way in the kitchen. This is what we've been thinking about for 50 years. No, someone like me, doing the dishes like me, and it doesn't work. No well, no nice, it's uh, not there. And this is the future, an arm that puts the dishes in, Sorry, because that's me at the moment. I mean, uh, someone has to put the dishes inside the ontology and the dishwasher, and that will be a human interface. The human interface will come back in a little while. So while we were dishwashing the world, uh, that's where AI started getting real traction. If you think that this is all science fiction, again, uh, this is the digital end of Europe, collects an enormous amount of data on all possible things. They collect the data about how much or how many people in Europe use a laptop to access internet wirelessly away from home and work, for other reasons. But to me, that's the dishwasher. Where are they? They never left the dishwasher. You're not at home, you're not uh, at work, but you are constantly within that environment which has been created to make sure that your safe wireless connectivity works seamlessly between here, Edu, Roam, etc. And that's a lot of people. I mean, more than 20% of all population. That's 500 uh, million people here and growing. So in the past, grandma used to walk inside a computer. Now they're inside a dishwasher, as it were. Then at some point, uh, her daughter stepped out and the computer became something that was in front of her eyes. But today, her uh, granddaughter uh, is actually back inside. It's back inside in a way that she doesn't really see the computer around her. But all those sensors, all those things that are working, all that communication, I will show you in a moment, they're all happening around there. So that's the space envelope in the world that we're living in. Big change in technology, big change in our age, big change in our environment. What about us? Which is always the question we ask anyway, so at the end of the day. What has happened to human nature? And that's basically the topic of the book, The Fourth Revolution. It's the fourth because, um, Oh, by the way, I'm still on record. Uh, John Searle, uh, a, a philosopher, um, has criticized the book not understanding it, thinking that I was attributing the fourth revolution to myself. If he had read the book before writing the review, he would have known that uh, I was not. And there is a hero here coming up who is not from Oxford, I have to say. So the previous three revolutions were put together by Freud, uh, self-serving advertisement, but no, smart guy. And he said, look, what I'm doing is something that has been already done before me. I'm discovering a new uh, area, a new scientific uh, endeavor, and so on, new science, that casts a completely different perspective on us. 
The first revolution of Copernicus, we thought we were at the center of the universe. All of a sudden, we are moved outside that. And of course, it makes a big difference in terms of your anthropology. I mean, who you are, who you think you can be, how important you are in the universe. On this tiny little speck in the middle of nowhere, maybe that's not so relevant. So we retrenched, and uh, as well, we use a, a second special stage, which is you know, this uh, biological centrality. We were the species. You know? And of course, Darwin came, and sorry. Now you have to give up also that centrality. And Freud said, well, look, at least we retrench into a sort of Cartesian centrality of the mind as being transparent to itself, rationality. Say your brain is like a, a shoebox. If you look inside, you see exactly what's in, in it, and normally nothing, but if there's something, you will find it. And he says, well, sorry, you have to give up that too. Uh, you, in fact, there's multiple you uh, fighting with each other anyway. So these were three revolutions, and I, my suggestion in the book is that we're just undergoing a fourth revolution, which I attribute to Alan Turing. Uh, and um, we said, look, the real difference here is that by developing this, all this wonderful science, computer science and ICTs, we're casting a new light on ourselves. Not because this AI is really intelligent, but because it's telling us a different story about who we could be and what we could become. So we're not disconnected agents. No, pick up any book and there will be this single agent, possibly rational, well-informed, etc., with interest. No, not at all. It's all about networks. We are connected and we are kind of information organisms. We've always been. I mean, we live by you know, uh, information in terms of um, expectations, fears, memories, um, feelings, and so on. And we share as sort of information organisms, this infosphere which I described before, this space of information, with other agents, you know, some biological, some non-biological, some uh, uh, hybrid, and that's the kind of revolution that uh, I explore in, uh, in the book. So the difference is that in this infosphere, as information organisms talking to other agents of various nature, things like this used to be the norm. You had a, a barcode, and uh, luckily someone put a bit of English under it. But the new barcode of Wikipedia is not this. This is what you get. And what's the story behind? That this is not meant for our eyes. As simple as that. This is meant for artificial eyes, for other agents to be consumed. So we are generating in this world information that is not for other human beings, but it's for machines to read and <coughs> consume and register and process. And you start thinking, last time you had to prove that you were a human being to a machine because that machine was worried that you might be another computer trying to crack that particular sort of code or anything, including try just to generate another ent entry in Wikipedia. Uh, well, that sort of movement of saying, well, show me that you are a real human being by reading this sort of mixed text and so on. Well, that's, that's the world in which we live. It's not made of intelligent agents, but it's made of smart agents that can interact with us in different ways. So this is the picture that we have. There should be no sound, I hope, because the, no sound is meant. And it's just a little movie to show you how much we are sharing with the rest of the world. So this was 92, and there were about a million things connected with each other. Move forward, uh, and uh, 2003, a half a billion things talking to each other. It's not us, eh? these artifacts talking to each other. Then you start talking about the Internet of Things in 2009, because there's a lot of stuff, about 8.7 billion entities that are interacting with each other independently of us. Huh? And of course, the story goes on. It's going to be 11.2 in 2013. Further down the road, keep going, thank you. <laughs> and uh, you reach uh, yesterday 14.4 uh, billion, 18.2. For those of you too far away, still 22.9. It ends in 2020, don't worry. 22.9, uh, 28.4, and down the line, all these things that are interacting with each other. That's multiplied by billions, the effect that you see when you go home and there are all those little red and blue and green lights going, well, that is some, something talking to something else. So by 2020, we'll have about 50.1 billion things talking to each other in this infosphere, which we share with them. Uh, it's a bit confusing and unclear to know exactly what that means. So here is a fixed picture. This is oh, sort of uh, projections uh, by uh, Cisco, by the way. 
Uh, this uh, now you can find it uh, everywhere on the internet, so no secret. World population 2020: 7.6 billion people, more or less. Connected devices: 50 billion devices per person, about six, seven per person. Now that includes a lot of people who never made a telephone call in their life. So people in this room, multiply this by three, four, five. Make sure that basically you have about for each of us there are about 30 entities out there talking to each other behind our back. This is what it looks like. This is humanity and how many we are by 2020. And these are the devices talking to each other, how many they are or they will be. And in case you, know, you have a different perspective, we are fast disappearing as the communicating <laughs> sort of species on this planet. If you come from Mars, you want to talk about communication, well, by 2020, this, you know, make it 100%, these are devices, and the line is going to go down, especially since we hopefully will stop multiplying ourselves, whereas this, they keep growing. So scary, maybe, maybe not, uh, but what are the challenges here? What, what's going to make a, a real difference? And I'm, gonna, I'm going to list five challenges, and these are broad topics, and I'm sure we can have the rest of the day to discuss. I'm doing fine with time. I'm looking at the, okay. uh, the boss. Yes, okay. <clears throat> First of all, this environment, is it friendly? I mean, are we really building this environment in a friendly manner? Now, we had a wonderful conversation over lunch about how unfriendly uh, or, say, less uh, human-friendly this environment can be. Uh, and I mentioned already in lunchtime, so each of us has had the experience of, of being told, well, that's the only way we can do it, sorry, because that's the computer way of doing it. And yes, I understand. And oh, I share the pain. Oh, I, I wouldn't do it myself. But I'm sorry, that is the way it has to be done. So how friendly is this environment? Um, sorry, how, how friendly is this environment to the world? Um, coming back to the environment, yeah, I mean, these days, because of the gadgets we have, we, we don't notice this too much. But you know, growing up, and I can see a few people like not my age, uh, there was a time when th that laptop on your legs was really warm, unpleasantly warm. I mean, it was so warm, you had to have something in the middle because you couldn't just hold that laptop on your legs for more than an hour. It was burning. That's thermodynamics. That burning is coming from somewhere. That's energy. Energy is consumption. Consumption is the environment. So this is a recent uh, data from the Climate Group 2008. Apologies for recent. But they tried to quantify the advantage and the disadvantage caused by ICT when it comes to environmental issues. And this is what you gain by, you know, in terms of decrease. All that green stuff is not, as it were, is harm not done to the environment thanks to ICTs. Good old days, not true, but just as a joke, when we didn't print books but only digital stuff. Well, that's no less consumption, good for the forest. Again. But at the bottom, we forget that there is a black, dark sort of impact. Remember that laptop on your legs? Well, that comes from somewhere. And that's why, for example, all the energy, uh, the green energy produced by Finland, the whole thing has been bought as a block by Google. All the energy produced by Finland, green-wise, it's going into supporting uh, Google warehouses. And that's why you, know, you build warehouses next to uh, a power station, because it consumes energy. And therefore, what we doing here for the chess players uh, in the room is, uh, is a gambit. We hope that by decreasing this much while increasing this much the impact on our environment, we have enough time for this to be a successful gambit. We are losing our pawn, as it were, to win the game. If there isn't enough time, the pawn will lead to more losses and the end of, as it were, life as we know it on this planet. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gambit, and I think it's a, a sufficiently reasonable gambit, but I'm not sure that the politicians who endorse this picture see it as such and understand it as such. I was telling you about the human-friendly uh, point before, and uh, we moved th through the environment. But the human-friendly idea is, is basically summarized. I, I actually borrowed this from a company, uh, they had this beautiful presentation and uh, I said, well, can I just uh, use it? So Jerry, I said, we shape our buildings, day after they shape us. Oh, that's so smart. I mean, really, I just, 
True. I mean, there is no determinism in, in, in the kind of technology that we build. But once we have built them, uh, they really stay there. And they stay there for the next ten, uh, sort of, uh, generations. The, 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 the cab driver was complaining about the narrow streets in, 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 in Dublin. Well, yeah, well, we didn't put them there for cars, but now they're there, and then you better uh, negotiate them. So how friendly is the, is the environment that we're building? So against any determinism of any sort, or things like the wide no, magazine editorials, or so, uh, what technology you want, nothing. Don't even try that trick with me. It's our responsibility. Don't, don't for a moment think that, oh, it's technology. Yeah, as if. It's up to us to shape the next generation's world. And they will complain with us if we screw it up. Having said that, once it is true that once you put it in place, well, it's very hard to you know, reshape it from scratch. Why a Roomba world? Uh, I think that will be memorable. This is, by the way, someone who actually attached a little camera on top of Roomba. Roomba is a... Um, I see some Roomba. Uh, Roomba is, I'm not being sponsored, by the way, <laughs> but I do have a Roomba, and it's a, it's a, a little robot uh, that cleans the house for you. It's a Hoover. <coughs> Highly recommended, especially as I was doing the Hoover. This big, this high, it's like a big, sort of thick Chicago pizza going around. Um, there are several models. I have the cheapest one. They're very expensive. Uh, there's a Roomba also for the garden, just in case, that does the grass. Uh, <laughs> But why a Roomba wall? Because for recently, moving house, my wife and I decided to have a new sofa. And we decided, of all the sofas we like, knowing what we do, we actually decided to have one with higher legs so that Roomba can go under it. <laughs> and you start thinking, how many choices of that kind are we, uh, are we making today? I mean, this is a joke, so, to, so that it sticks in your mind. But how many Roomba walls are we building right away? And if you have... Um, a paying system where, as we had at some point uh, in a town, where the only way to pay for the car park is through a mobile phone attached to a credit card, where just the week before it was coins, well, that's a Roomba world, because you have cut off a whole chunk of the population. Who has, so the complaint is enormous, and the city council has to scrap the whole project and go back to coins. Loss of money, etc. Challenge number three. We only have five, so bear with me. Make stupidity work for intelligence, which is not easy. Because in the couple here, uh, the analogy is um, uh, between, uh, you know, with, a, with a sort of spouse, spouses. And imagine that she, being on record, better be careful about wife, um, she is super smart, but also super lazy. And he is an idiot, but very active. He does everything, 24 7. So, so. Now, the question is, who is going to adapt to whom? The intelligent lazy to the active but totally stupid, or the totally stupid but very active to the intelligent lazy? Of course, it's the intelligent lazy that is going to adapt. Oh, yeah, I didn't quite like it the way you do the dishes, but that's OK. You do them, I'm fine, and so on. So basically, you know, the, the idea of making CBD work for intelligence is not trivial, because intelligence has the wonderful capacity of being adaptive. And stupidity, the wonderful ability to be tireless. And that's not uh, trivial. So why is this an issue? Because recently, you might have heard, I hope not, but just in case, you uh, were astonished hearing some famous people from Cambridge, the other place. Course, yeah. what, what do they know there? <laughs> About the arrival of AI. I mean, and uh, they will dominate our lives as a total nonsense. We've got plenty of problems, but not this one. Now, this is Alan Turing. Uh, that's the Leibniz Prize, uh, and that's the medal that they give to the Leibniz Prize. The Leibniz Prize is uh, uh, awarded to any piece of software that will pass the Turing test. The Turing test being something, just for the, those of you who haven't been exposed to this, very quickly, uh, you are in this room, you interrogate two entities on the other side of the wall, you don't know who is who. And by a question and answer game, you need to guess who is who. Who is the machine and who is the human being? If you cannot spot it, and there are a few constraints, such and such amount of time and so many questions. If you cannot spot the difference, well, the machine has passed the test. It's as good as the human. Hopefully, you pick it up an intelligent human, because, of course, if it is your moronic neighbor, well, uh, you won't see the difference, <laughs> trust me. But no, hopefully, you, know, you have a brilliant guy and the machine, and if you don't see the difference, pass the test. Now, the Turing test, therefore, has become a kind of a distraction and a bit of a game and so on. When Turing introduces the Turing test in his famous paper in, uh, published in Mind, uh, 1950, 
he asks a question, which is, can a machine think? And then he adds immediately after, too meaningless to deserve discussion. That's not the point. You don't ask whether a machine can think, you ask, can he perform as well as something else that we know can think? At that point, we know that is passing the test. Unfortunately, on the Lebanon Prize, there's exactly the phrase that they printed on the medal, can a machine think? So either there's a very subtle you know, irony here, and we didn't catch it, or they didn't read the paper. Uh, I went for the second option. Um, who reads these days? Now, this is um, the same problem multiplied by a few billion dollars in California, Google. You must have read also that Google is buying anyone and anything that do, does artificial intelligence on a global scale. Seven companies, last time I counted. There's audio, but we don't have time, and I don't want to show it to you, but this is the, the text. For those of you too far away, it was um, uh, an interview that uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, at the time executive chairman of Google, gave. Uh, it was a meeting at the Aspen Institute, July, July 16, 2013. That's important, huh? 2013. Ask, will any machine will ever pass the urine test? Turing was de deadly wrong. He said, oh, in 50 years, we're born, or 30 years, or whatever. He gave a number, and it was like, not even close. But Eric uh, Schmidt said, well, quote, many people in AI believe that's why you are you know, the executive chairman. That's smart. You don't say, I believe, because then I can prove you wrong. He says, many people believe, well, it's their problem, but that's. Many people in AI believe that we are close to a computer passing a Turing test within the next five years. And I hate aubergine, and on the record, I bet a plate full of aubergine, that is not going to happen in 2018. By 2018, hello, I will eat a, pla a full plate of aubergine if this is going to happen. Why? That's an easy uh, bet. Sorry, this is the actual interview. The easy bet is based on this. This is, was the winner of 2013. He, oh, by the way, three prizes, uh, sil um, gold, silver, and bronze. Two have never been awarded to anyone, the gold and silver, because they're both science fiction. The bronze is awarded every year to the less worst performing. Of all the bunch you know, of applications, the one that is less rubbish wins this few dollars. It was Mitsuku chatbot. Uh, oh, some of these have weird behaviors when it comes to sexual interaction, so I, you have to be careful. Um, he won the bronze medal for the following conversation. And again, I read it for those of you too far away. I try, you can try it on, online. Uh, me, um, what can someone do with a pair of shoes? Reply, quite a lot of things. Okay, that's fine. I don't know the difference. Such as, or for example, a tomato. Mm. Well, that starts being weird. Anything else? That is all I have for right now. Remember, I need to spot who is the computer and who is the machine. Uh, what's wrong with the following sentence? The capitals of France are three, Lyon and Marseille. How can there be self-help groups? <laughs> so the usual trick of, with these machines, you know, replying to a question with another question. I tried that with an undergrad down the examination, never works. But are you sure? Well, I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not so sure. Thank you, computer. You are quite welcome. What sort of computer? And you go on and on. And this is the sort of uh, interactions you can have. And you say, oh, that's good news. But, uh, that's all sold. When the last Lebanon Prize, 2014, that piece of uh, chunk uh, got the third, third in line. This is a conversation. And when asked, this car could, the car couldn't fit into the parking space because it was too small. What was too small? Oh, no, a walking encyclopedia, you know. <laughs> because this, this is as far as we went 50 years ago in this sort of fake interaction where you can just talk in automatic pilot. And I've done this a trillion times at a high table when you don't want to listen. And say, oh, what's your topic? What are you doing? Oh, it's what's your college? You just go through the usual stuff and uh, you're not even listening. Now, of course, machines can do that for us. But that's why all this came in 2008, whereby we thought that we were getting stupid by the day and machines were getting intelligent by the day, is past uh, its sort of uh, uh, headlines interest. The end of theory, the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. No, it makes this article obsolete. And it has been obsolete since Francis Bacon decided that all you had to do in science was to collect data. Wrong at that time, wrong for the past 500 years. Nobody does science in this way, nobody.
collecting data and asking questions. It's the first thing you say to students, don't go to the library, don't read. Think, come up with a problem, and then you check the data, and then. Or is Google making us stupid? What the, the internet is doing to our brains? Now, remember, no, machines are getting more intelligent. Well, no, what Google is doing, or things like that, is polarizing. It's polarizing because the stupid become more stupid and the intelligent become more intelligent. And that's the trouble. Because if you're smart and intelligent these days, with those tools, you can do amazing things. But you have to be pretty smart. But if you're dumb, well, then you become dumber by the day because, of course, you, you know, relax. The analogy I, I had in uh, New York during the festival, I said, look, it's like a car. You can take the car to go to the gym and get fit, or you can take the car to buy the milk and get fat. So polarization. Non-neutral. Is that the mistake? Oh, so oh, it's, it casts both. No, 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 that's not neutral. It means that more will get more and less will get less. And that is the real trouble. So, problem solved? Not quite, because of course, so these machines, uh, being smart but also stupid, they need humans as a module sometimes. Uh, so, here, this is a, a New York Times um, uh, article some time ago when during American elections, uh, Twitter started getting problems in de, uh, disambiguating uh, the phrase Big Bird. Because, of course, nobody was referring to Sesame Street. Everybody was talking about uh, the US uh, sort of government, uh, big government, and so on. But they used Big Bird as um, an analogy. And Twitter came out with uh, something that everybody knew, but you know, was stated uh, loudly, that they use graduate students to disambiguate this stuff. Because you know, they're the only ones who can actually grasp the meaning and make sense of the meaning. Now, at this stage, maybe in the future, there will be other machines doing it differently for us. But what's happening here is that you have you know, a memory outperforming intelligence, meaning algorithms and big data, you know, basically doing better than you uh, remember last time you played chess and you won against your iPhone, good old days. But syntactic engines, namely our computers, they need semantic engines, like us. And uh, therefore, we start becoming, as it were, human inside. You know? module within a bigger machine that needs us and our intelligence. So what has happened in the past is being, a phrase I like to use is that no, future is where the past happens again with a twist. <laughs> and uh, we often often work as interfaces. Remember that arm that I show you? No, between you know, the dishes outside and the dishes inside? Well, I'm just the interface between a dirty kitchen and you know, a cleaning up system. And you know, hopefully I would like to have a robot there. But no, if you look at the gentleman or the lady here, they are just interfaces between a petrol station and a car. And we could not think at the time, and we did not have the technology to make sure that refueling a car could be done by a robot. But for goodness sake, I mean, we have robots on Mars, but we cannot refuel a car automatically. You need a human being to do it, to unhook, put the stuff, and put it back. If you think of it, for more than one billion cars in the world, for I don't know how many petrol stations, if anyone invents a system of doing that automatically, that's the next billionaire. But it's very hard. This is a strange robot, you know, all different, different models. So are, we doing, are we going through the same problem with electric cars? Yes, we are. Have you seen that? There's someone who has to plug in the thing. No, don't, don't do that. I mean, clearly, if we're going to go electric, Surely there has to be a way of parking and end up chuk, and then you leave it. I don't want to be the one who actually plugs in the thing and then one billion cars electric uh, and 10 years later just have the same thing. Oh, if only we had thought. But the lady is the same problem. She is an interface between a GPS and a car and she's also fast disappearing. Like the gentleman on top. I uh, never met anyone like that but uh, my grandfather uh, would have. Or the lady at the bottom. This is something that we often forget in terms of uh, interfaces. Technologies uh, help us to remove interfaces, not in the sense that we're not going to do it, but in the sense that there's no job there for someone to do it for you. Uh, I don't know about you guys here, but Sainsbury back in Oxford, it's me scanning all this stuff all the time. So it's me putting the stuff in the dishwasher, it's me scanning the chicken at the counter, because the job is gone. Because the technology is gone good enough to make sure that you don't need a specialized human to do it. Anyone can do it, therefore the customer can do it, therefore it's up to you now. And I'm not being paid to scan my own food. Which leads me to, we're still on that particular challenge, eh? don't stay with me. This is uh, recent data about the American job market. I, I think I, I, you know where I'm going. How are we doing with time? 
Well, no, continue on. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're doing fine, yes. Um, Again, for those of you a bit too far away, I apologize for the graphics a little bit uh, too small. Um, this, of course, as you can tell from The Economist, uh, they divide, I don't know why exactly, between services and government, uh, probably because government provides a disservice, I don't know, I mean, but, uh, <laughs> whatever it is, the reason. But between, between services and government, the, if you consider the whole population of the job market in the States, there's 90 plus percent of jobs. Services and government. Manufacturing is going down quickly and is already way below 10%. Well, remember, more than 90, below 10. So just a fraction, 2, 3, maybe 4%, depending, is agriculture. Now, someone, when I uh, said this uh, recently, says, oh, yeah, but no, in terms of uh, GDP. And they say, no, 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 also in terms of GDP. Agriculture doesn't, doesn't contribute much to American wealth. And if we could just stop you know, having that sort of hang out from you know, millennia of starvation in Europe as well, we could do much better. But what's the point here? Well, very few people uh, have anything to do with uh, bioware, agriculture. Just a little bit have something to do with hardware, manufacturing, and most have got to do with software, one way or another. This is fine. Uh, it's a bit weird. Uh, but... Well, that's what happens, and you must have seen this before. What happens when you start calculating the effect of computerization on that job market? If everybody is in the software industry, more or less, you know, and handling paper and handling information one way or another, from airlines to, you know, uh, well, if you start an automatization of their market, that's the kind of a curve you're going to get. Some jobs are super safe. You don't want to get a massage from a robot. It's just not going to happen. So that's going to be safe. But do you care who actually handles your uh, flight tickets, uh, say, at the desk? Oh, you could care less. So those jobs are going to go. And basically, about 47, about 50 percent, more or less, of uh, uh, jobs at risk, according to this particular calculation, which was done as, uh, on a, a study in Oxford, make news, and so on. So saying, OK, well, that's an advanced society. Maybe, maybe so, maybe not. What is missing from the picture? That is more data. Well, recently, I was in Finland for uh, a, uh, an interaction with the uh, Ministry of uh, Transport. And interestingly, in Finland, they run the same analysis, but with one variable that the previous analysis hadn't taken into consideration in full, which is legislation. What if the legislator says, yeah, that's doable, but we don't allow it? And if you think that that's just a joke, uh, imagine the following. How many trains you know, in Ireland are going from one place to another, uh, it's a fixed road, can't take turns, a, without a driver? And the answer is zero. To the best of my understanding, there are, at least in Britain, a train is not allowed to go from London to Manchester without a driver on it. Why? Because of you know, legislation. I mean, you just don't do it. How many airplanes are flying from one place to another without a pilot? Well, this is all doable. I mean, it's, it's all, especially trains. I mean, no more, nothing more trivial than going from A to B on a train. Well, just legislation doesn't allow it. So how many cars are going to drive downtown without uh, a driver? Say, how many cabs are going to be there? Well, it depends on the legislation. Because if the legislator says illegal, that's the end of the problem. It will not happen. So it's not about technological feasibility. It's about you know, the legal framework that allows that or not. Once you take that into account, this is the American picture, same data, just a different graph, but exactly the same. And there is, on the left-hand side, the Finnish picture, which I would say a more European picture, where basically Brussels <laughs> and Helsinki have been taken into account. What happens when the legislators say, we don't like this. You better have someone on board. And in fact, two on board. And in fact, how many stewards were well, those three people, et cetera. So the future is complicated. And when you're told that jobs will go, they will go if technology is left alone. But we are also in charge. And depending on the legislation, they will or will not go. It depends. It's, it's an open uh, call. You may say one day that supermarkets are forced to have people at the counter to scan the stuff and, and 
responsibility for that. And if you do that, well, plenty of jobs around the corner. Change number four, and we're getting close to the end. May predictability empower freedom. Remember, those were the two challenges we've been exposed to. Smart technologies are becoming you know, really good at doing things that we do because of our intelligence, but they're also getting good at predicting our freedom. And that's one of the two, no, the, the pillars of our definition of free, intelligent agents different from humans. This is, you don't have to read it, it's a, it's a, it's a passage from Deca that has uh, kept hundreds, if not thousands, of students in Oxford awake at night trying to understand it, because he says something really odd. He says, suppose you measure freedom on the most free of all possible agents, God. N nobody can be more free than God. Well, God doesn't change his mind. It's not that God thinks, I'm going to shave today, as opposed to, I'm not going to shave tomorrow. He's not going to make a different, no. So God is rational, and he's free. So the more you incline towards a particular rational, free decision, the, the more free and rational you are. You're just as free and as rational as God. God couldn't be any better. That was the model. But unfortunately, that is highly predictable. We all know that the closer it gets to 2 plus 2, the better you get at saying 4, <laughs> because that's the only. So if you are very rational, incredibly rational, as we were saying at lunchtime, you're going to come back home with the same toothpaste, even if you don't remember which toothpaste you like. And uh, that's a personal experience. It's rather disturbing. So if you're very rational, and uh, basically that's what you go through. This is a famous case. You must have seen it before, so just a reminder. But Target developed, no, in 2012, this is an old story, developed a whole series of products, about 25, which show that if someone buys those products in their order at their time, not only she's pregnant, they know at which stage of pregnancy the, the person is. You know, months. They just forgot that maybe that was a bit too personal. Uh, they sent tokens for uh, their pregnancy, and uh, the tokens were received by the father of the lady. <laughs> was hugely upset and complained, called Target, says, like, are you insane? Are you crazy? My wife and I, we don't know you're having a kid. They says, no, we're not talking about your wife and yourself. We're talking about your daughter. So my daughter is only 16. I had an explanation, and the daughter said that she was going to tell them sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the target already knew, uh, the family didn't, and luckily that was in the United States. She did, didn't get stoned uh, or you know, thrown uh, out of the house. Uh, Say, okay, find one more member of the family. But this is the kind of uh, technology that is available today in terms of challenge. How do we make this technology improve, support, enhance, foster freedom as opposed to become a constraint? And predictability becomes something that we sort of carry around our neck uh, as a uh, as a way, this is real stuff, it's, it, and of course it always happens in the states. Since two thousand and eight, old news: no, courts have been uh, no, the police and the courts have adopting predictive uh, policing and predicting uh, uh, measures. This is just the, the data again, economy stuff, no research, no nothing. Else, only he knows. No, it's it's public domain. This is what happens in uh, L.A when you adopt some predictive policing. In other words, you start saying, well, something, some crimes have happened there. We think they're going to happen again or not. What's the probability and so on? The place where they adopted it and the other places where they didn't. Incredibly successful. It does work. I mean, we are predictable, uh, especially in you know, large numbers. Uh, the larger the numbers, the more predictable we are. And funny enough, that's what I was told, uh, not that we know. Um, the software that has been used to have this predictability of recurrent crimes is the same software that's California that it was used initially developed for earthquakes. The point being that they wanted to know where earthquakes happen again if they have already happened once. And oh, the maths is the same. If, some, if something happens, how likely is it that it's going to happen again? And you change the parameters. It's crimes, not earthquakes, but bingo. I mean, it's human beings. It's not uh, uh, earth moving, but you have the same solution. So the effectiveness tested by the, the LA police is huge, and uh, to the best of my understanding, this has already been uh, adopted in the UK, in uh, Manchester. So it's getting some traction, but above all, that was the surprising thing. And again, uh, let me just read for you. That's February 2013, so it's still recent, but not that recent. It's not uh, yesterday. 
use the Philadelphia court beginning using computer forecasts to predict future criminal behavior and change, therefore, the penalty. So, well, this guy's going to do it again unless we really sort of make it sort of stick, as it were. So just a little bit you know, more punitive in case. Or we said, no, no, this is just a good guy. He's not going to do it again, so we can be more lenient. Based on what? It's not minority report. But based on ordinary forecasting data stuff. And, yes, it's already happened. So this is not, as it were, technology helping us to be free, but us sort of linking freedom to. And because we are very predictable, this is where some of the challenges are coming from. Remember, freedom and predictability. This is a quick story of uh, Nike with some highlights. 2006, Apple and Nike launched Nike uh, plus iPod. Make a couple of mistakes, serious mistakes in terms of uh, privacy. They fix it and then start it again. It's a running tracker. Nike uh, starts a serious shift in the branding strategy. Nike uh, used to be a producer of things but they want to be producers of products that are experience, so uh, processes, that not stuff. There's no real money in producing stuff. That's, that's what China does. But experience, that's, that's the real money. So in 2012, Nike uh, starts producing the fuel band. And that's, uh, that's more stuff. But you start thinking, oh, that, what's the real money? With stuff, hmm. 2013, 18 million users of Nike Plus online. That's, that's the real money. You've got 18 million people who have money to waste, they buy a fuel band, and time to waste, credit cards, probably English speaking, has some mind gold. 2014, 28 million users of Nike. Nike starts saying that they will discontinue the fuel band, concentrating on consumer's experience, elementary. But what is the consumer experience here behind? is the predictability of these consumers and what you can sell them next time. I don't want to pic uh, not picture this into dark uh, tones, but unless we are a bit aware of what's going on, I think measures will not be taken. And finally, looking at uh, how we yes, do it. Ken, it's just a quarter past, and I know some people have to get back. If you could just summarize, because sure. I think I'd yeah. like some time for questions. I know. No we need people. to make technology uh, make us more human, not less. And, uh, Instead of showing you what tattoos look like these days, uh, or, or the kind of funny things you can do to your arm, this is real stuff, not biohacking, or growing a, a year on, your, uh, on your arm, implanting things in your brain, or no, guiding things around. Uh, basically, we make, need to make sure that the technology that we are developing, as I said, we are in charge, is going to make us more human, not less. Remember the Roomba world? Well, that's, that's part of the, the pitch. So what can be done? Conclusion? Well, I think we need to do this couple of things, the two I, as you were. One plus one, but it really is intelligence plus inventiveness. We need to be smart, and not smart as in technology smart, but we need to be intelligent, and we need to be inventive about solutions, because that's the only way forward. So bottom line, for the philosophy among us, we need to upgrade our views about you know, who we are, what the world is like, and how we can interact among ourselves and with the world. That's four things. Us, the world, interactions among us, interactions with the world. These are the four lines where we really need to upgrade our philosophy. And it's, an, it's a new chapter. It's not erasing the old ones. It's not burning, like Hume said, the books in the library. It's just writing a better chapter for us. And for that, I believe we need better, not less technologies. I'm not anti-technology in, in any possible way. We need to have smart technologies, absolutely. We need to have technologies that regulate other technologies much better than they do now. You want to have some technology checking that other technology is doing its job properly. And we need technologies that monitor other technologies so that everything in terms of what's happening and how something gets regulated is also monitored so that we can step back and have a better life. But for that, there's a lot to be done. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.